All right, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you uh, for having me here uh, to the Black Ignite team and family. Um, for those of you who may not know me, my name is Amari Souza. Uh, I am a re researcher by trade. Uh, I am a social advocate, as well as a professor at Texas State University. And for all of you, I just want you to know that I am extremely thrilled and ecstatic to be here. Today's discussion or keynote um, is going to be titled Branding America, Expanding the Lens Behind Your Beyond Eurocentrism. Uh, so the first thing that we're going to discuss today is what is a brand? A brand is, uh, as competition creates uh, infinite choices, companies look for ways to connect emotionally with consumers, become uh, irreplaceable, and create lifelong relationships. A strong brand stands out in a densely crowded marketplace. People fall in love with brands, trust them, and believe in their superiority. How a brand is perceived affects its success, regardless of whether it's a startup, nonprofit, or a product. Brands distribute signs that consumers can interact with, use, and remake. Brands are often equated with feelings of authenticity, patriotism, community, and means by which meaningful connections to others happen. Brands wield their power to set forth an idealized version of their customer, one that the customer wants to identify with because they see it in some of the things that they either see in themselves or want to. Uh, take, for example, Nike Apparel. Once known as Blue Ribbon, Nike Inc. is an American multinational corporation engaged in the design and selling of footwear and apparel. The name Nike, chosen by Jeff Johnson, a Blue Ribbon employee in homage to the Greek goddess of victory. The goddess is symbolic of the desire to win, and the Nike swoosh represents her speed and power. Images generate meanings for the interpreter, but those meanings are interpreted through all of those elements working in conjunction. Because the images and the icons used to support a brand exist in a world that contains ideologies, those images and icons must interact with those ideologies for harm or for good. Nike's pairing of the swoosh symbols with, with athletes like Michael Jordan, Mia Hamm, Roger Federer, Serena Williams, and Tiger Woods creates a connection between the product and the champions who endorse them. The products, in turn, become uh, considered the choice of champions, and the brand thus sells the idea that in order to become a champion, buying into the brand is the necessary first step. Nike not only sells sports apparel, but it commodifies an idealized self which is only actualized through purchasing of their products. As such, the consumer participates in what Frankfurt School called the pseudo-individuality, an experience of selfhood promoted by the cultural industry. Pseudo-individuality refers to the ways that culture forms and can define, and, and, um, can define a viewer-consumer user as individuals, while in reality, they are selling a homogenous experience. A brand is a visual symbol that signifies a consumer's purported, uh, purported uh, social status. Uh, designer Hank Willis Thomas explores this connection between the modern brands and the genesis of the concepts in his series, Branded. His concept, he, he connects the original meaning of branding to burn signs of ownership onto the flesh of livestock, to the history of slavery, and then the relationship of product branding to black culture. In modern contexts, this forces branding uh, in modern context, this forced branding of human beings has been meaningfully done away with. However, voluntary branding has replaced it in a way for individuals lower on the social, uh, social hierarchy to show their loyalty to those above them. This new form of branding does not demonstrate ownership. Rather, it is used as a form of social mobility for those at the bottom of the hierarchy. Let's jump into logo iterations for for the country. If you break down the color palette, which is something that's often done for brands, the blue in the American flag stands for the color of vigilance, perseverance, and justice. The color red uh, stands for hardiness and valor. And the white stands for purity and innocence. All of these combined creates the marker that we often recognize when representing or speaking about the United States of America. Let's talk about brand architecture. Brand architecture refers to the hierarchy of brands within a single company. 
this architecture is broken down as such. You have the parent company in this instance, I'll be using the United States as the main model. You have the subsidiaries. Uh, this flag is the state of Texas where I currently reside. And then you have product services or territories uh, to which I'm using Puerto Rico as an example. Artists such as Kara Walker have used her pieces and her work to actually talk about some of these uh, distinctions. Um, for some people, it may be hard to view a group of people or a land as territory or products, but this piece exemplifies um, how that can be, uh, how that has been done traditionally. If you're unfamiliar, this piece by Kara Walker called the Sugar Sphinx was built in a Dominion factory, a Dominion sugar factory. Uh, sugar, uh, for those who are unfamiliar, um, was sugar cane was the main thing that uh, slaves in the Caribbean worked on. Uh, so folks like uh, folks from Jamaica, uh, Puerto Rico, Trinidad, things of think places like that. That's that's the main thing that we did, um, and that that labor from these slaves were actually utilized to build the the sugar industry. So Kara Walker decided that she was going to take uh, sugar and build uh, these sculptures, both of the sugar sphinx as well as the uh, models of slave children that were also used for the labor. This was done in a Dominion factory in Brooklyn, New York, before it was actually demolished. Additionally, you have designers and artists like Hank Willis Thomas that uh, talk about uh, products uh, such as Absolute uh, rum and, and, and other types of uh, products that have actually uh, that have actually become uh, big products based off of you know uh, slave slave labor as well. As you can see in this picture, he's using a uh, absolute bottle of rum. Again, rum utilizes uh, sugar cane in order to be made um, and overlaps that with uh, images of the Middle Passage, uh, kind of paralleling that connection between slave labor and the product that we consume. Um, another example of how this actually works out in terms of the parent company subsidiary and ter uh, territory or product um, can be looked at with the 9-11 attack. Um, I, as a New Yorker, was uh, in high school when this happened, uh, roughly about five or six miles away from the World Trade Center when this actually went down. Um, but as the nation was attacked by a um, foreign adversary, uh, the nation, um, represented by the president, then took, you know, immediate action, um, semi-immediate action. Um, and also made a very public display um, to the subsidiary, which is New York State, in order to build solidarity. Um, if we look on this uh, graphic that I've created, you have the parent company, or nation, the United States, which was attacked, the subsidiary, the location where that attack happened uh, was in New York City, where I resided, and the product and service happened to be the uh, first responders. The immediate action um, was going to war with those who um, created the attack. Uh, created the attack. There were several things that were done in order to empathize and um, comfort the subsidiary. But the people that were actually forgotten were the uh, first responders who actually happened to fall under the product and service category. An example of this is an article that was written uh, that talked about how many of the first responders still suffer from cancer and respiratory illness um, and were some of the people that were, uh, although the first people to respond to the incident, were some of the folks that were actually forgotten. Another example could be considered uh, to consider is uh, Hurricane Katrina um, and the flood in Louisiana. This image uh, is an image of several black residents that if you notice um, are waving the American flag versus waving white flags as others um, who happen to be stranded in Katrina uh, happen to do. In her book, Sister Citizen, author uh, Melissa Harris Perry talked about how this waving of the flag was extremely symbolic. It was their attempt to say that they were part of the overall nation and should be entitled to some of those same protections. If we break it back down to the sim to a similar graphic that I was using prior, you have the parent company, which is the United States, the, the subsidiary, which is Louisiana, and the product and service actually happening to be black bodies. 
to further illustrate this fact, you have the news coverage of these particular instances um, where people were attempting to survive. Um, the distinction between how that uh, attempt for survival was communicated very differently for black residents that were attempting to find food, um, especially those that have lost their homes and, and basically everything else they had. The definition that was given was uh, they were looting, uh, the images of them looting, which by definition, the use of the word looting reinforces the idea of black criminality versus what was used to actually communicate what white residents were doing which said that they were finding they were they were finding food versus others who were looting for food um art, articles such as this one also illustrate that point as you know it was difficult for newspaper articles to figure out what to call katrina survivors um whether or not to reference them as refugees in reality um you cannot be a part of a nation while also being a refugee and if you are part of a nation, you can't be accused of stealing your own fruits. So let's jump into what is brand identity. So brand identity is a tangible, uh, is tangible and appeals to, your, to the sense. You can see it, you can touch it, you can hold it, you can hear it, you can watch it move. Brand identity fuels recognition, amplifies differentiate, differentiation and makes big ideas and meaning accessible. Brand identity takes desperate elements and unifies them into an entire system. So in essence, brand identity is culture. So what is culture? Uh, culture is learned. Who we are as individuals, each habit and belief that we hold is an, ex is an extension of the rituals and structures of our various cultures. Um, this was something that was suggested in Will Storer's book, Selfie, um, which basically talks about how everything that we see, we believe, that we do, that we hold, um, hold near and dear to us is something that we've learned and experienced within the culture that we happen to inhabit. Our way of learning is not always formal. Um, we can learn things from friends, from parents. We are inevitably shaped by the language of visual symbols presented by those who wish to change or maintain those rituals and structures. Our society is steeped in visual narratives, often utilized by journalists, politicians, and other opinion leaders to perpetuate cultural myths about the products they offer and or the consumers who need them. Visual symbols inform us on how to interpret beauty standards. What our heroes look like and what we view as formal and informal, professional and unprofessional. Um, this tweet was done by a young lady in 2016, where she Googled professional and unprofessional hairstyles and then showed uh, the top results for both. Uh, to the left, uh, all of the natural black hairstyles were viewed as unprofessional and to the right, all of the white hairstyles were deemed professional and appropriate for the workspace each of which furthers the brand idea that white signifies purity and innocence. We can go back to the idea of what is culture. Culture is learned, but it is also something that is shared. We share culture by telling stories about our inception as a nation. We share culture by talking about who inspired that inception and who we give credit for that inspiration how we depict those that we worship. Even in the stories that we give to our children to watch. Uh, for example, um, these, this pretty much is a row, two rows of Disney princes, all of which whom are very Eurocentric in their appearance. Even the one that isn't uh, Eurocentric in scent. Furthermore, uh, these cartoons often depict people that look different, whether by skin tone or ethnic features, as those who are villainous, uh, furthering the idea that white is innocence and purity and anything outside of that um, is dangerous. In July of 1839, a slave revolt led by Mende captives took place on La Amistad. Enslaved in Sierra Leone, 
the Mende captives uh, were transported from Havana, Cuba to be purchased on a plantation. The African captives were able to take control of the ship, killing some of the crew and ordering the survivors to sail the ship to Africa. The Spanish survivors, however, secretly maneuvered the ship north and La Amistad was captured off the coast of Long Island. Um, the Mende on La Amistad were interned uh, in Connecticut while federal court proceedings were undertaken for this, their disposition. The owners of the ship and the Spanish government claimed the slaves as property, but the U.S. had banned African trade and argued that the Mende were legally free because the issue, because the issues of ownership and jurisdiction, the case gained international attention. The Amistad Committee um, was founded in 1839 by Louis Tepain, uh, Simon Jocelyn, and Joshua Levette. They organized a legal defense and raised the money for the Mende Africans during their imprisonment. The committee, sensing that they had to win the battle of perception in addition to the legal battle, welcomed the assistance of any symbolic artists. During this time period, the negative portrayals of Africans were no different from those of African Americans that appeared in popular literature and public art galleries. In an attempt to win the battle of public opinion prior to the litigated case, the committee commissioned Nathaniel Jocelyn to paint portraits of abolition of, uh, of the slave revolt leader, Joseph Sinke. Countering the views of Africans, Sinke's portrayal pre presented him with a toga reminiscent of Greco-Roman philosophers and a cane and staff held similarly by a shepherd in Christian art. Sinke's painted image utilized the symbols of Western society in order to humanize his existence, further paralleling his existence with whiteness in order for him to be recognized as human. This idea of an American brand positioning whiteness as, in a sense, whiteness is purity and whiteness is good can be seen in the doll test done during the uh, Brown versus Board of Education case or made popular during that trial. Um, for this case, uh, a white Cabbage Patch doll as well as a black Cabbage Patch doll were placed in front of several children. Each children were asked to give positive and negative attributes uh, to raise or point at, at which doll uh, they felt uh, positive and negative attributes most um, related to. Um, as you can probably guess, these children, uh, most of whom were black, each gave all of the positive attributes to the white doll, even though the black doll looked most uh, similar to them. This idea of whiteness um, equals purity um, and everything else equals danger can be uh, seen in old images of people protesting integration. It can also be echoed in the protest uh, at the Unite the Right rally. If culture was learned and culture was shared, culture can also be adaptive. Just like fashion, which may change from season to season, year to year, the way in which people of color can be discriminated or the way that brand message comes across can also change and evolve. We've gone from being sold where we can sit or where we can eat to where we can live, to what cities that we're welcome to when the sun goes down, back to what schools our students and children can study in. Um, this is an article from February of 2020 done by the Economic Policy Institute which suggests that since the Brown versus Board of Education case, schools are continuously getting more and more segregated. James Baldwin had a very popular um, quote uh, from a debate that he did um, that continues to live rent free in my head as I continue to do work like this. Uh, the quote goes as such, it comes as a great shock to discover that the flag to which you have pledged allegiance is not pledged allegiance to you. It comes as great shock to see that Gary Cooper are killing off the Indians, and although you were rooting for Gary Cooper, that the Indians are you. Old depictions of Native Americans and their savagery, especially the danger that they pose to white women, um, is something that's been consistent in terms of how other people who fall into other categories have been depicted. Uh, to the left is a painting that showcases such, and to the right is a still from the movie Birth of a Nation. This movie, one of the most popular movies 
ever and is something that's often studied in cinematic uh, classrooms, um, came out in 1915 and basically talked about the dangers of black people um, and the dangers they would have on the South during Reconstruction and more importantly um, in the film, the dangers that they pose to white women. This fear of uh, the other harming white women has often been the death of many people of color, including Emmett Till. Um, these are photos from his funeral. Um, the bombing of Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Black Wall Street, which had just celebrated its 100 year anniversary. And the question I leave you guys with is, as visual creatives of color who function in a system that perpetuates particular ideas, what can we do in order to expand that brand narrative to make it something that's more inclusive? I understand that that's a really big question. And I think that's something that we should all ponder going forward. So for that, I would like to thank you guys all um, and I hope you guys keep in touch.